Uh, okay, last time we were talking about cryptography, um, and these were kind of, you know, basic ideas. So we were talking about, we, we gave a bunch of definitions and terminology, you know, decrypt, decrypt, crypto system, you know, plain text, cipher text, all those things. You should know those like the back of your hand. Uh, then we looked at four classic ciphers, okay? What were those four ciphers? Substitution. Simple substitution. Double transposition, one time pad, and code book. Okay, so you should know those four ciphers. Again, we'll see all of those uh, concepts come up again um, later. Uh, okay, so here's, you know, people have been doing cryptography for thousands of years. Here's just five randomly selected <laughs> items. I don't know how, how these end up on the slide, but we, we mentioned most of these things uh, before. I do just want to mention this one. Uh, crypto problem related to the U.S. presidential election of 1876. Anybody ever heard of the U.S. presidential election of 1876? It was actually in the news about 10 years ago. In the, in the election of 2000, the U.S. presidential election of 2000, if you recall, that was essentially a tie, right? The popular vote was essentially a dead <coughs> That happened one other time in U.S. history. That was in 1876. Okay, now 1876. You have to think a little bit about what was going on. What happened in the 1860s in the United States? Civil War. This thing called the Civil War. Yeah, okay. So there was the Civil War ended in 1865, and then there was a period called Reconstruction, okay, where the North basically occupied the South and, you know, ran the governments there. And, you know, it was pretty... Uh, uh, contentious period, okay, and that was still going on in 1876, the so-called Reconstruction period. So it's a very you know, tense period in the country. Okay, now you think politics is dirty today? Nothing compared to that time. Okay, uh, Hayes, the Republican candidate, was Rutherford Hayes, and his opponents called him Ruther Fraud Hayes. Uh, Samuel Tilden was the Democratic candidate. He was known as Swindling Tilden, right? Uh, and a popular vote was essentially a tie. Actually, Tilden won by a very, you know, tiny fraction of a percent in the popular vote. But, of course, in the U.S., the president is not determined by the popular vote. It's determined by the Electoral College, okay? And the way that's supposed to work, at least in most states, is that whoever gets the majority or the plurality of the vote uh, in that state is supposed to get all of their delegates to the Electoral College. So essentially, it's winner take all per state, okay, is the way it's supposed to go. Uh, they don't always vote the way they're supposed to vote, those delegates to the Electoral College, but usually they do. <laughs> well, okay, so what happened in 1876? There were four states whose delegates were in dispute, and I'm not making this up. One of those four states was Florida. So that was enough to swing the balance. Okay, whoever got these four states' votes was going to win the election. All right. Yeah. Uh, typically, is it the smaller, big, bigger states that are more decisive? Well, I mean, this was close, right? Yeah, it could be. It depends. You know, it's, you can come up with scenarios where you can lose the popular vote pretty bad and still win the electoral college. Okay, just because of the way it's sort of winner take all, state by state. But in this particular case, this is just the way it worked out. So there were four states, Florida, which was not a huge state at the time, uh, Oregon, Louisiana, and somewhere else. So four, four states. Okay. Now in 2000, how did they decide about the votes for Florida? Who ultimately made that decision? It was the Supreme Court. Okay, in 1876, it was not the Supreme Court. They actually set up a commission, 15-member commission, who, who was chaired by the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but it was technically not the Supreme Court. Uh, and it was split eight Republicans, seven Democrats, and it voted eight to seven, no surprise there, <laughs> to give uh, all four of those disputed states uh, votes to Hayes, uh, the Republican. And so um, he won. Okay, now... Okay, what does names have to do with cryptography? Okay, so the thing was, uh, essentially, you know, as soon as this was over, not Tilden personally, but his people started accusing the Hayes people of fraud. And they said, you must have bribed those electors in those states in order to get those votes. That's the only way you could have possibly won. Okay, so was that true? 
Well, it turned out that Tilden, now the guy who lost, right, and who's accusing Hayes of bribery, Tilden, it turned out, had sent a bunch of encrypted messages to his supporters in the field in these various states. And uh, some reporters got a hold of these after the fact, a couple months after the election. So what was in these encrypted messages? I mean, it was pretty unusual in that time to send encrypted messages, right? So what the heck's going on? Well, OK, these newspaper guys, they had no training in cryptography or anything like that. Uh, they were actually able to figure out how the, how the messages were encrypted. Okay, what they did was kind of a weird system. Okay, first of all, they had sort of a partial code book. So they took what they thought were the important words and they substituted for those important words. Once they had done that, they had, they had a permutation of the words in the sentences. Okay? And the permutation was fixed depending on the length of the sentence. So if the sentence was 10 words, they always used the same permutation for 10 word sentences. All right, so the code book looks something like this. You know, the important words, what they considered important at that time. Greenbacks was a tar political party, you know, Hayes, votes, and so on. Remember this one, we'll see it. Um, telegram, they would substitute the word more So they're substituting place names, right, for uh, uh, important words. Uh, okay, so first you apply the code book, then you make sure the sentence is a multiple of five words. If it's not, you just pad it out with words until it comes out to a multiple of five. And then you use whatever the fixed permutation is for that particular length of sentence. Uh, okay, now, if you're the newspaper reporters, uh, you'd have to have a little bit of insight or you know cleverness here to think that they're using the same permutation. But once you get to that point, it's pretty easy, right? Because if you took a bunch of sentences that were all 10 words and you sort of lined them all up, even with substitutions for the key words, it's not too hard to unscramble those sentences. If you just try one sentence, might be hard, but if you have several, it's not that hard, as you may find out in the homework. Um, so anyway, so they figured out what the permutations were, and then they were able to undo the code book more or less from context. Okay, they could just figure out what some of the keywords were, and there were other messages that were not encrypted. Various things helped them out. So they basically broke all these messages. Um, important thing to note here is if the messages of a certain length, say 10 words, you're using exactly the same key for all messages of 10 words, right? So really you're using the same key a lot, depending on how many messages you have. Uh, okay. So here's an example of, a, of an actual ciphertext message. Okay, so Warsaw, they read, all unchanged last, our idiots can't situation. Well, okay, what's Warsaw? Sorry, telegram. telegram, okay, so Telegram goes in there, and again, the reporters had figured out what the permutation was, and for 10 words, it turns out to be this particular permutation. Unscramble it, you find this message. Can't read last Telegram, situation unchanged, they are all idiots. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so uh, reusing the key actually, you know, it was a weak cipher no matter how you cut it, but using the key like that over and over and over really made it, it really horribly weak. So, okay, so what did the messages say? Again, remember this was Tilden sending messages to his supporters in the field. What they showed was that Tilden and his people were trying desperately to bribe the officials in those states, but they were not successful at doing so. So exactly what they were accusing Hayes of trying to do is exactly what they were doing in practice, just not successful. Okay. Uh, okay, so just a few more little historical uh, bits here. And we mentioned the Zimmerman telegram from World War One. Uh, moving on to, to the period between the wars, um, there's a famous line by U.S. Secretary of State, uh, Henry Stimson, who said, gentlemen do not read each other's mail. What do you suppose he meant by that from a crypto point of view? It's unethical, don't do it. It's unethical in particular if someone, say, encrypts their message. You just leave it alone, right? Because they should have, you know, they should expect to be able to send their messages back and forth without you snooping in on what they're trying to say. 
I mean, it sounds good, but you know, you think about what was happening around this time, the Japanese <clears throat> militarists, the Nazis, and all that stuff, you know, rising in the 30s. Um, maybe it would have been a good idea to try and figure out what they were actually saying, <laughs> yeah, instead of uh, just letting them do what they want. And in fact, if you go into NSA across one of the doors, this is posted in a big, large type, gentlemen do not each other. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> So anyway, moving ahead to World War II, uh, that definitely could be considered the golden age of cryptanalysis. All of the major Axis ciphers that the Allies attempted to break, they had success with. German ciphers, Japanese ciphers, you know, strategic uh, diplomatic ciphers, uh, tactical ciphers, all of them essentially were broken. So it was pretty amazing, you know, you had this uh, access to encrypted traffic almost in real time in many cases. Probably the biggest success for cryptanalysis in World War II was the uh, sort of extended battle of Midway and Coral Sea. That was really the first success the Americans had against the Japanese. The Japanese fleet was much larger, much superior at the time, but the Americans were successful largely because they knew exactly what the Japanese were doing. Uh, they were getting this intelligence in real time. They often had the uh, messages decrypted before the Japanese did. Okay? It was just that successful. Um, the two most famous ciphers of the war were the Japanese purple cipher. Uh, that was not used here. This was actually, sometimes people mistakenly say that, but that's not the case. Uh, these were actually uh, uh, tactical ci ciphers, different ciphers. This was used for diplomatic communications, so that was actually pretty important in its own right. Uh, but this is probably the most important single cipher of all, the German Enigma. Uh, the British first were able, to, first the Polish actually were able to break it, and the British gathered a lot of intelligence using the Enigma cipher. Uh, later the Americans as well, they got into Europe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. Did the Axis powers break any of the uh, Allies ciphers? There's some evidence that they did. You know, they had some success, just not on the same order of magnitude. Um, you know, there were certain ciphers the Americans were using in Italy, say, that they were able to break, but they weren't able to sort of get you know the the same level of intelligence out. 